Thanks so much, Sarah. And just to say, I was the only founder of Levin. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my, what I see on the right, which is me and people. So I need to find a way of moving that. Have you moved? Um, no, so we see it's perfect at the moment. It is. Okay. I just hope it doesn't disrupt the text. Um, but I'm going to keep my phone on hand so I can keep my time to check. So I keep looking over. That's what I'm doing. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to join. And I actually am really delighted to be in, in a morning where there's... Um, been pre presentations on um, perceptions as well um, because you know the reason I call ASM that touchy subject is because of the very diverse and sometimes polarized perceptions we we have of it um, so today I can make my slides move yes um, I'm just going to explain very briefly um, 11 sources um, we are a for-profit social venture 10 this year about, about 10 this week um, 15 team members, um, mostly in Europe, but over 200 sources around the world. And we mostly work in responsible sourcing, responsible mining and artisanal and small scale mining. So that's why I'm talking to you about this today. And that's just some of my team. Um, I can't really see this. So I'm going to move myself down like that. Um, so today I'm going to speak a little bit about um, what is ASM. It's like a 101 on ASM. And forgive me if you already know about it. Um, and I'm going to whiz through it. There's a lot more, such a lot that can be said about this fascinating subject, but just really give you a flavour and a taster. And then we do very many initiatives at Levin Sources. As a social venture, we, we like to shine a light on issues that we can see are not being given enough attention in the policy arena, but they're kind of sitting there like an elephant in the room. So in, in the past, we've done stuff on um, artisanal mining in protected areas and critical ecosystems or illicit financial flows, we're founding something now on the relationships between LSM and ASM. So I'll talk about that. But also, um, if people want, um, I had prepared some slides on COVID and its impacts on ASM and how that's changing. So if, if your questions come to that, that's absolutely fine. That's great. Um, so what is ASM and why is it such a touchy subject? I've got to sort out these boxes. Can I do that? Is that better for everyone? It's, it's been perfect all along, Estelle. Just oh, it really know. has? Yes, okay. it has. Yeah. Okay, so I'll just keep going. It's what I see. It's my inexperience on Zoom. So artisanal small-scale mining, it took years, years for us to agree a definition. And thank you to the OECD for really making that happen. Um, because it is, people used to say, you know it when you see it. Uh, because it's such a big spectrum. And I think that's because mining is a spectrum. All the way from the individual artisanal miner through to artisanal miners that start to organize and work together, through to them formalizing into small enterprises, eventually into medium scale mines and so on. Apparently BHP began as a bunch of artisanal coal miners who originally went out, well, they went out looking for gold and found coal, and there you go. So anything's possible. Um, and it is formal and informal, and I'll come to that later because it's utterly crucial. And we think about it as simplified forms of exploration, extraction, processing, and transportation. But these people self-identify as miners and have quite deep understanding um, of aspects of mining. Um, it's low capital intensive, high labor intensive. There are far many more artisanal miners in the world than there are miners working for large scale mining companies. And it is men and women um, working in all different types of structures. Now I'm focusing here on Africa, but actually there are about 40 million artisanal miners um, all over the world, um, in Asia, Latin America as well. Um, and in Africa, it creates 2 million direct jobs, but the multiplier effect, um, that was in 1999, the multiplier effect is, is about five times that as we, you know, when we quantify it. What's interesting about this is the growth we've seen since um, 1999 when Norman Jennings at the ILO did his report. At that time, there were 13 million artisanal miners in the world, and we've tripled that in 30 years. And that growth is going to continue. What this map shows is just a sample of the countries where it happens and the number of individuals directly involved as miners or processors. But these statistics tend not to include the traders the exporters and the ancillary services that depend upon the economic multiplier effect from artisanal and small scale mining. I'm going to speak about its benefits and then I'm going to speak about its impacts because I think most people know a lot about its negative impacts. And here I focus on the economic benefits, but I do want to make a really important point that when you want to understand artisanal and small scale mining and the people's motivations for doing it, don't only look at the economics. There are very, very strong social um, motivations 
uh, for people to, to do artisanal mining. And in my own research, um, I've spoken to um, miners in post-conflict settings who say they mine for gold or diamonds because it's a way to be respected by the chief if they find the diamond, for example. It's a path towards dignity and status, um, which is kind of strange when you look at the degraded conditions in which miners live and operate um, artisanally. But this is a strong motivation for them. For others, for young people, often they migrate away to an artisanal mining site as a kind of way to discover youth and freedom, untying themselves from gerontocracy of their agricultural communities they may come from. I call it like university of artisanal mining because they just, you know, take drugs and meet girls and boys and have a lot of fun together, kind of like people who in the north might go to university for the same experience. Often they stay. So there, there are these kind of things that we do need to understand that, that people's motivations are multiple often and not just economic. If you want to manage it, you have to know that. So some of the economic benefits are, you know, in, in situations of poverty, cash is king and people need to eat. And in situations of emergency, um, like where your existing livelihood has been destroyed through a, a, a extreme weather event, for example, or an, um, a recession or a disaster, or even COVID-19, people will need to find other ways to live and they turn to artisanal mining for that. And we often see rushes in those kinds of situations. And for the remotest rural areas, it brings cash in, which is hugely important. And it creates and maintains the local economy and keeps young people there and keeps them from migrating to cities. There's a strong job creation multiplier according to the type of mineral. Our research has shown that that multiplier effect in Uganda was 0.4 jobs for every one miner for development minerals, which are really industrial minerals, those used in the domestic economy for construction and things like that. And then 3.8 jobs in Kenya for gemstones, which is substantial. And overall, um, the economic multiplier is about one and a half of total ASM income. And so I like to raise the question, should we be taxing the artisanal miners who are barely getting enough to eat? Um, or should we be taxing uh, the, the associated economic opportunities because they're really transforming this mineral wealth into other forms of potential wealth locally? The issue there to manage is, of course, capital flight and tax evasion by the exporters through smuggling, which is a big deal. Coming into the global economic benefits, not just those for the producer nations, um, ASM really matters to mineral markets because about 20% of gold and diamonds mined every year come from artisanal small scale mining. Higher than that for tantalum and tin, a bit less for cobalt. And sapphire is an extraordinary 80%, but let's be honest about this statistic, it's been there for a while. And with um, larger mines developing in gemstones, that's probably needing a bit of revision. Um, one of the reasons ASM has some, is helpful is because, you know, for example, when the gold price goes up, often we see a lot more artisanal mining of gold happen because people opportunistically go, brilliant, I can make some more money. And they might move out of their farming livelihood temporarily into artisanal mining. They might move out of their teaching livelihood temporarily into artisanal mining, sadly, to, to, um, to respond to that. So it does help where there's a crunch in mineral markets. Usually that hasn't been the case in COVID. And I can come back to that in present uh, um, questions if you'd like. Um, interestingly, previous to COVID, we would have said that it's marginally impacted by externalities like coups and elections. In fact, it's often encouraged as people try and you know, raise money for their election campaigns. Um, they, they will send people off mining uh, to raise the money for their campaigns. Again, COVID has had a big impact on, on the viability of artisanal mining and, and the opportunity to actually earn money from it at the moment. And so on. I'm going to skip these next two in the interest of time. And when you think of an artisanal miner or a small scale miner, it's not unusual for people to think of men wielding machetes in Zimbabwe doing terrible things. And I understand that because that does happen. Um, but it's actually heavily populated by women. Um, and in Africa, between 40 and 50 percent of the women are, are sorry, of miners, artisanal miners are women. In Guinea, it goes as high as 75 percent. Um, in the work we did for the UNDP in Uganda, we took a gender lens, as we, we usually do in our research, and found very interesting differences within the industrial mineral sector there about the proportion of women to men being involved with different minerals. But it, whilst part of female participation is high, it's very important to state that women are often confined to the less valued and less well-paid roles um, within the sector, including auxiliary tasks like 
um, petty trading, selling pharmaceuticals at the, at the or food or water at the mine sites, for example. Um, but there are exceptions and there are some tremendously influential and important women leaders in ASM communities who, um, who not just represent the women in their communities, but have, you know, they do very well out of it. And I think coming back to my point of motivations, although women can often face challenges in ASM communities and very serious ones um, in relation to things like uh, sexual harassment, sexual violence, gender-based discrimination and so on, for many of them it is an opportunity for greater autonomy and this is why they do it and they take those risks. So let's come to some of those negative impacts. Um, when you read the news about ASM, you'll often see some of these things. Yes, there are widespread human rights violations, especially in conflict affected and high risk areas. Um, and very serious ones at that. Uh, there is also quite extensive environmental degradation from artisanal and small scale mining. A lot of attention has been put on gold and the use of mercury in recent years. About half of artisanal miners are involved in gold. And um, that's, that's a very important mineral for the sector. Um, but there are other issues that really do deserve um, research as well. Our research on mining in protected areas, 10 years out of date now, we'd like to update it, um, found that over 70% of protected areas in Africa are impacted by ASM. And I expect that, has, um, that statistic has changed with the growth in ASM we've seen in the last 10 years um, and also the, the broader environmental degradation. But I, I would like to qualify here that the work we did for the World Bank on forest smart mining um, a couple of years ago um, found that very interestingly, uh, the forest health in certain countries was improved in certain cases, not always, in certain cases where there was artisanal small scale mining, um, as opposed to where there was agriculture happening. Um, and so there are types, types of artisanal small scale mining that can happen in forests that will have a lower impact negatively, um, but it doesn't mean it's a positive impact is just less damaging than other types of natural resource based livelihoods that that could be happening in the same place. So it's not black and white. There are so often conflicts and I'll be coming to one at the end of my talk. Um, huge gender inequalities and the, the health and safety is actually fortunately getting a lot more attention these days. We have tragedies happening on mine sites where there are landslides and tens of people die um, in one incident. Um, I monitor the ASM news and there are these types of incidents happening a lot. But the good news is that the market is now paying more attention to this and therefore there's more pressure on artisanal miners trying to sell into responsible mine, uh, markets to, to take health and safety more seriously. And of course, around this, you know, it's something like $18 billion worth of gold every year is produced from artisanal and small scale mining. Billions, <laughs> just gold. Um, you get a lot of dirty money flowing in and flowing out. A lot of integrity issues, corruption, extortion, um, and of course tax evasion as well through the extensive smuggling um, that happens. But again, coming back to the fact that it isn't binary, this is a crucially important point for me, and I have to come, I have to talk about this all the time with large-scale mining companies who we work with, who are working under compliance regimes that are organised and of course mandated at the national level. Um, that say very clearly, usually, that this is your mining concession, no one else can mine on it. But this doesn't mean that when artisanal miners are near your concession, that it's all consistently illegal. And the artisanal miners themselves may not perceive their presence on your mine site as illegal, because they may not give two monkeys what the national law says, because the state society contract could be very weak between governments that can be inept, as we know, um, and communities who are poor and struggling. So we have to understand that because if we don't, it, the conflicts get worse. So this is a spectrum that we use to help our, our um, clients understand and categorise the artisanal miners that they're working with or dealing with um, as stakeholders, whether it's to do with responsible sourcing and supply chain due diligence or large-scale miners doing their risk assessments and their risk management. Um, and, uh, sorry, just looking at my notes, yes, the, the point here is this isn't just about miners, this is also about the traders and the exporters. We must never forget 
that they're also part of this because they are often the most important part of this if you want to influence what the artisanal miners do and do not do where and where they do not mine. Um, and please remember that one individual miner may in the morning be working perfectly legitimately and legally with license on their own concession and then at night be sneaking illegally into someone's concession, stealing their asset and laundering it under the, their own legal license later. So individuals can, can wear multiple hats at once. And of course, what we're trying to do is help move people, you know, up, you know, um, well, down, let's see this, say this register increasingly from the criminal to the legal eventually. A uh, very important concept um, is legitimate mining and something that the OECD has helped define in their FAQs for ASM. And I strongly encourage anybody wanting to make sense of this and working in ASM management or risk management at their minds to, to check that out. Now, before we had COVID um, happen, I gave a talk at Indaba and it was such good news. It was wonderfully exciting to be there on the stage talking about all the progress that there has been since I began working in this stuff 17 years ago. And um, what a great momentum we have had, this big push to formalize the ASM or dialogue at last and inclusion of ASM in policy setting. Um, more mining companies shifting from guns, guards and gates, which just leads to human rights violations um, and costs for them ultimately, to engagement led management. A blooming of responsible sourcing initiatives across multiple mineral categories, gemstones, gold, tin, cobalt and on it goes. Um, so feeling real momentum in many of the countries where we operate um, to, to support the formalization and development of the ASM sector. And then also downstream in markets, more downstream players wanting to get directly involved and solve and help solve, come with their leverage and their influence to support this sector and responsible sourcing from it, which is a shift from when the OECD's due diligence guidance first came about. There was a lot of knee-jerk reaction, very simplistically, as people said, just don't source from ASM. A lot of that still, but there are pioneers proving that you can. And by doing so, you can, you can uplift what's happening locally. I think generally there's broader consumer expectation as well, particularly, you know, jewelers that I work with are obsessed with what millennials and Gen Z want, and they want authentic, human stories about you know um, improving people's lives not necessarily that it's perfect yet but that there's a journey happening that's shifting what's possible upstream and what stories can be told what compliance issues get prioritized as well um, and we've seen more public private partnerships as well um, organizations like the eprm in europe the ppa in the usa um, also joining forces to really tackle this Multiple standards incorporating ASM, whether it's IRMA or RJC, responsible steel, and increasing media and sector attention. It's in fashion. A little bit different now as things are put on hold, but that's, that's a teaser for another talk. So let me come to this point of the LSM ASM community of practice and conscious of time. I'm going to probably whip through these in just a couple of minutes to give you some, a chance to ask me questions. I've been working with large scale mining companies since 2007. My first experience was in Sierra Leone for a medium scale mining company that wanted to understand uh, and have innovative ways of working with the artisanal miners in the community as part of their production system. It was innovative for, for the diamond sector in Sierra Leone at the time. I think it's less innovative now as I've come to understand how ASM happens in, in many, many countries. And there are some shining lights of good ASM LSM management, some countries and some companies really doing the right things to, to help these cousins in the sector work together better rather than being in such competition and conflict. But we still find with existing clients um, and with others that we speak with in the community and with <laughs> statements from CEOs that will remain unnamed right now from major mining part companies, that there's a lot of misunderstanding on what you need to do to manage this issue well. And we wanted to bring people together to, to overcome this. So the problem is that ASM occurs on or near the concessions of many large mining companies around the world. This, is just, this isn't just an African issue, it's, it's big in Latin America um, and also in Asia. And it's happening across multiple mineral categories, not just gold. 
Um, it presents diverse risks to mining companies and their investors. We're working with Satala um, on exactly looking at this issue, um, for example, and generates sometimes very severe impacts and outcomes, which I will come to in a second. I want to restate that unfortunately, many mining companies feel compelled to take a security led approach rather than a security facilitated approach. And when you take a security led approach, in my experience, what you end up getting is protection economies where the artisanal miners will pay off the local police uh, to get access or to all members of the, of the mining company security forces themselves to get access to the concession, which creates a vested interest in maintaining that um, at the political level. Um, which can prevent uh, the government relations department of the mine really addressing this well. You get deteriorating community relations uh, because of course there's going to be incidents of violence um, and uh, having people removed uh, from the, the, the um, concession sometimes with force. Um, you get issues where security led people are, are removed in ways that the miners lose their tools and, and they get confiscated. And that's very hard for miners, artisanal miners, because they, they get into debt to get those things. And that worsens their situations and can lead to human rights impacts for them. Um, some mines I've been involved with helping and um, uh, there have been allegations of torture uh, um, by the uh, ASM allegating, alleging torture by the security of them in order to intimidate them. Um, allegations of sexual extortion of the women if they want to access the mine site um, and and more um, yes and and all of this just makes a mess and it creates it creates fear for people for, for people's workers it creates a lot of time and attention and money that has to be put into managing this and diffusing the situation once it's getting worse and worse and what you really need to do is think about ASM right from the beginning this is where Sarah Caven's talk was so important um, a couple of days ago which is that at the exploration level your exploration team or the junior company that you you might be acquiring the, the concession from um, or the deposit from um, are crucial to building positive social relations with the ASM from the start so an engagement and approach now all of this if you don't do it well lead to production losses as you have to um we've seen some mines that have had to go into care and maintenance because they've been completely overrun or they've just they've had to lose their site um, we see lower investment ratings there was a mine in congo who lost seven percent of their share price because they had a about 40 artisanal miners die um the, on a, in a landslide when they were illegally mining on their concession we've seen lawsuits um uh for human rights violations costing companies millions and huge reputational damage as a result, and so on and so on. So we need to fix this. And yet, at the corporate level, I struggle to often get understanding as to why this isn't just a compliance issue. And this is the barrier. Here are the barriers to why we can't change this. Full stop, ASM are just illegal and shouldn't be there. They should just go away. <laughs> they don't have rights to be on our concession. So let's just get rid of them. That's one I've come across. Um, it's complex. You know, it's not just something that you can figure out with one little study. You need a, a group of members inside your mining company to be dealing with this um, in a committee level. That's resources, it's effort. Um, and you have to identify and understand properly the gatekeepers in the community. I've had a mining company who the resettlement expert didn't consult the ASM community because they weren't going to be entitled to any resettlement benefits because they weren't a legal um, business uh, being impacted. Um, and when and so what they understood about the ASM was completely wrong. They felt that if they if they um, influenced the local authorities, the local authorities could manage the ASM. Turns out they had a massive migrant ASM population controlled by people from countries hundreds of miles away who were the traders and the financiers coming in, ultimately financed by people in Asia, pushing the money all the way down and the stuff's getting all smuggled out. And they had no idea that if they needed to influence this, it wasn't just the local authorities. It had to go elsewhere. So it takes investment to understand it and manage it well. The other thing I find is that, and maybe I'm wrong, I hope you'll tell me I'm wrong, is that you know, compliance is understandably hugely important, hugely important. It must, it must come first, but it can't be the only consideration or it can't trump the sustainability piece. And we have to get compliance departments to be just a little bit more creative um, 
and, and flexible to allow the sustainability team and the community engagement teams and the government relations teams to do their job on this because this is difficult. Structural, we've seen where there's not enough empowerment of site to make their own decisions, where corporate hasn't got their act together or where corporate wants to do things a certain way, but site is led by people who are, let's say, old school and have a particular, sometimes racist view of the artisanal miners. I come across that too, and they just therefore say, there's no hope, let's not bother, um, and so on. And there's more. Let me move on. So what, what do we want to do? We want to build a pre-competitive platform of concerned mining companies alongside enabling stakeholders. Um, who can together protect the miners and their investors' commercial interests while respecting human rights and contributing to sustainable development. They want this to be really practical, um, generating tools and detail that can uh, be hopefully mainstreamed. This will do a lot for the sector, for large-scale mining companies and investors I'm running out of time. It will also do stuff for the artisanal miners, governments and the environment. I have all the business cases here and I can share my slides if people want to see that. Um, what we want is we want people to participate. We want to get gather expressions of interest, particularly from mining companies at this point in time, but also governments, multilaterals, industry associations and NGOs who would be keen to be part of a broader community to support this. And to get this going, we're looking for some small funding um, for six months. So I think the amount here could, could last a bit longer to do the design phase properly um, with that core group of really committed mining companies. We have quite a few already signed up. Um, and keen, we have some governments and multilaterals also on board. So we've got some momentum already, but I do want to just raise awareness about this and invite you to come and speak to me after. That's it. Sorry, Sarah, that I've been a little bit long. Um, okay. Maybe there's one question. That was absolutely fantastic, Estelle. Thank you very, very much. And 